Uh, hi. Uh, in this video, I want to cover uh, some important aspects of uh, dynamic spectrum sharing, which has uh, kind of become interesting of late. It will just be an overview, so there are obviously a lot more details. And it's probably going to be downlink biased with a few notes on the uplink. My name is uh, Srikant and I am with NanoCell Networks. So uh, currently many operators across the globe have uh, invested a lot in LTE. Uh, they have uh, LTE sites. Um, they might have combined it with uh, some Wi-Fi as well. Um, maybe other technologies like license assisted access, etc. Uh, some of them could have just implemented some of these things uh, recently and it involves quite a bit of capital expenditure apart from uh, spectrum costs and so on. Okay. So now with 5G coming up in a big way with a lot of fanfare, operators would definitely like to have 5G as a part of their portfolio. However, there is a challenge with 5G which is that one is of course the cost especially in these times but also the fact that the low and mid band spectrum availability exclusively for 5G is difficult in many areas. Of course FR2 5G is a completely different aspect okay so we are talking about dynamic spectrum sharing of course obviously and only in the FR1 wherever there is already existing typically LTE coverage okay so one is affording new spectrum in these times might be difficult Availability of new spectrum in many countries is also an issue. Okay, so this is the I can say backdrop for the dynamic spectrum sharing. So operator wants 5G because it's new business. They could possibly gain some customers, get some extra revenues, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So how do they kind of uh, manage the spectrum and cost issue uh, and still get 5G rolling? So that's where dynamic spectrum sharing comes. It's basically running LTE and 5G on the same carrier, which basically means on the same bandwidth. Okay. So obviously the network side has multiple personalities in the same bandwidth, 4G and 5G. Uh, existing 4G handsets should be left alone. They cannot obviously be changed. 5G old style devices might not be compatible. So you need 5G devices which explicitly support dynamic spectrum sharing. So the principle of dynamic spectrum sharing is and the reason in fact why it, it might be worthwhile to have this dynamism is the fact that uh, traffic might not be uniform from day one. Neither is it uniform across sites time of day, etc. So how can we balance the 4G and 5G traffic requirements, okay, as they keep differing with dynamic resource allocation, okay? I think that's the real challenge or the real problem statement for DSS or dynamic spectrum sharing, okay? And we have already talked about why from a spectrum point of view, this is kind of interesting for many operators. So it will involve, if you have to accommodate this, it will involve changes in the infrastructure side, RAN side, and also in changes to the UE compared to a plain old 5G mobile. So now we're going on to the next step of technical details. Uh, 5G, of course, on the downlink uses OFDMA just like uh, LTE with a small twist that instead of just the 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing, we also support 30 kilohertz for data. Uh, so we could think of LTE 15 plus 5G 30 as well, but that option is not encouraged as of today because making them orthogonal can be quite tricky. Otherwise, you have to go for clear time separation or guard bands, which are all really not desirable. Okay, so 15 kilohertz on 5G, 15 kilohertz default on LTE subcarrier spacing is what's going to be happening in the initial days. And remember, we have to make sure that the LTE devices are not derailed because LTE devices already in the field cannot do much about them while we introduce this mixing of 5G with 4G. Okay. So 5G has to find some space in this LTE frame subframe context wherein it can send not only its data but it also has to send important synchronization signals 
which are essential for a UE to latch on to that 5G. Okay. So luckily, LTE has left a little bit of a door open where in certain subframes called multicast broadcast subframes, there is a lot more room to fit in a 5G waveform okay, in terms of continuity of time available, not having to do always on signals as rigidly as in a normal subframe, etc. Okay. So apart from the fact that both 4G and 5G will use 15 kilohertz, we will most likely use a lot of MBSF and subframes to accommodate 5G synchronization signals. But as we saw, the traffic requirements could be quite high on the 5G sometimes and so on. So to accommodate those kinds of traffic surges, we need more than the MBSF. So we also have to accommodate on the non-MBSF and subframes, as we call them. And there, there's a little bit of rigidity on the LTE side because LTE has its cell-specific reference signals which can't be tampered with. Okay, And to add to this, 5G also has certain reference signals which are not as flexible uh, as other things. These are called DMRS. Okay, So keeping both these constraints in mind, uh, the 5G standards as an addendum in release 15 uh, have come up with a scheme where 5G can have a little bit of flexibility on the DMRS such that you can have, as an example case, a subframe with one RB where uh, you satisfy the LTE users because you're sending LTE CRS. You give the room for LTE control where you don't put any 5G data and then you accommodate everything that is needed for 5G, okay, which is all with an NR prefix here, okay. So this is one way by which you can share uh, a particular frequency time uh, obviously, in this case, this resource block has gone to 5G. On the, another resource block of this subframe could be a, a 4G RB. Okay, so a resource block on top here could be a 4G resource block. Okay, so that's how we can dynamically allocate these RBs, and we can sort of uh, live together with some loss, as you can see. Okay, in release 16, we are bringing in more flexibility in 5G to make this a little bit more you can say um, sort of more tangible from a lot of perspectives. We've talked about downlink because that's where the serious challenges are, where certain LTE always on signals have to be present, certain controlled regions of LTE cannot be tampered with so easily, etc., etc. Uplink is a lot more flexible because we don't have such rigid constraints, but in LTE, though 15 kilohertz subcarrier spacing is used, we have a half subcarrier shift as we call a 7.5 kilohertz subcarrier shift. And that has to be followed by 5G for maintaining the orthogonality. Okay. So this is a slightly different uh, thing you might say on the uplink. It doesn't have as many, uh, you know, juggling of resources, but it's more of a fundamentally a new transmission uh, spoke or a small line added to the code in the transmission. So I hope you've got a glimpse of uh, dynamic spectrum sharing. As I mentioned, more details are available in a variety of resources. So I hope that's been useful. Thank you.